John, what drew you and Yoko together in the first place? Hmm. I have no idea, you know. It's bigger than both of us. Yoko? Well, that thing, you know. You can't say. You know. Yeah. Where did you two meet originally, you know, and where did it all happen? We met at Yoko's, one of Yoko's art shows at Indica Gallery, you know. I went along to see it and met her. And we met her. I met her a few times at different places. And then we clicked, you know. Mm. And you just kind of discovered that your heads were in yes. very much the same place. <clears throat> now, Yoko, do you find that John is influencing a great deal of your art, the art that you're still doing alone? Uh, your paintings and such. Um, what what kind of influence is he kind of exerting on on your work? Um, sort of. Um, uh, I don't know. Well, you know, John actually really changed the whole world in a way. You know, he influenced the whole world. I think. You know, in in that sense, I was sort of influenced um, directly in my work. You know, this. Um, <clears throat> I think my work lacked a kind of uh, uh, relaxed type of sense of humor, you know. I mean, there was sort of a, a cynicism in it, but there wasn't a, a real sense of humor. <clears throat> and also sort of uh, constructive thinking, you know. And that's the thing that I sort of got from John, I think. Well, how did you find John getting this together for you? No, it's not, it's not that he, you know, planned it and got together for me or anything. I mean, it's just <clears throat> something that you sort of, you know, just caught it, you know, through vibrations. You know, you just felt, felt it. Now, what were you doing before you met John as far as your art is concerned on your own? What kind of things were you into? I was doing various things, um, gallery shows, you know, of paintings and sculptures, uh, environments, things like that. Uh, music concerts of my compositions. Um, uh, what else? P writing films. poetry, you know. Oh, yes, making films. <laughs> yeah. Four of them, in fact, right? No, not really. Um, Number four is just an arbitrary number I picked up, you know. And uh, I made about seven short films before that, etc. Number four is actually the first uh, feature length film that I made. So number four is all illogical, you know. It doesn't mean anything. It's just a number. <coughs> now, I saw a clip of number four with the 365, you know, bottoms. What, uh... You know, what, what was the thing that, that was happening in this film? Why did you decide to do this particular type of thing? Um, it just came to me, you know, that um, all my um, works had a tendency of uh, being very um, uh, sort of puritanical and serious and all that. And uh, I thought it was getting too serious in a way. And ivory tower type, you know, so mm -hmm. very in but that mm -hmm. that was that. And, and I just wanted to communicate in a larger scale and uh, it was just good vibration. You know. right. And and number four had that rhythm, you know. John, how about Yoko's influence on, you know, as far as the songs that you're writing for the Beatles? I can't pinpoint that influence on the songs particularly, but She's influenced me, you know, so it'll therefore influence everything I do. Now, do, do you find that you, you're really into a, such a mixed media thing with art and film and, all, and, and music and the whole thing? Have you ever thought that maybe, since you're, in, since you're doing all these various things, that it's pr going to prevent you from doing one of them really extremely well? Um. That's presuming they're all different things. Huh? Mm. Yeah. Our point is that Films, music, everything's art, you know, it's communication and that's it. And it isn't a diverse career. It's the same career. We were both doing the same sort of thing in different fields, in a way. In fact, you know, uh, when you said that about influence and all that, you know, uh, it almost sounds uh, too uh, 
uh, logical and... No, and I didn't mean logical, I, you know, a school of uh, yeah, art I, has, no, in, no, I didn't you know, that, but what I mean is has influenced so-and-so. In our case, it's almost like uh, we were both doing almost the same kind of thing and both thinking in, in the same line, you know, in different fields, you see, or different places. And then we just met, you know, and found out that uh, what John was doing and what I was doing was more or less the same thing, you know, in the sense that, that we were trying to send uh, good vibrations to the world, you know. Now, the album, the album Two Virgins, mm -hmm. um, I, I've heard it, and it, it's not a one-time listening experience. You've got to listen to it, I'm sure, eight or ten mm -hmm. or eight hundred times to really mm -hmm. get into, you know, well, maybe what you, you two are doing. It, you know, um, it depends on it, the person. Yeah, yeah. It depends. And it depends on your mood. Yeah, it's not a catchy right? LP. Mm -hmm. you now, what, could you tell me the, the story? Of what what was behind Two Virgins, and you know how you did it? We were just uh, taping in my sort of what I call a studio, which is just a half a dozen tapes in the house that I used to fiddle about with, with, you know, mellotrons and pianos and things, and we just got together and played together. It's just a bit of off-stage noise, folks, don't worry about it. <laughs> and uh, we just did it, and then when we finished it, we realised we had an LP, you know. There was one influence he's had on me. If I did anything vaguely like that before, I'd just do it for sort of fun. And maybe play it to Ringo or, you know, play it to each other. But never carry it through, you know, take it, not seriously, but just take it any step further. I'd always leave it as an idea and in the air. And what she's done is sort of, it uh, sort of told me somehow that if you take it through to, to its, to an end, you get a buzz from it, just like having a record released, you know. And that's what I've been doing it, with different things. Now, the cover, you know, caused a great deal of consternation, especially mm -hmm. in America. Mm -hmm. They get very uptight about things like that. Um, <coughs> what, you know, brought this on? Why this particular way? Well, originally when we met, we met sort of as artists, you know, so-called or whatever it is. <coughs> and we got talking, and I wanted to record Yoko because she'd played me some of her ta tapes of what she calls voice modulation, which is just very groovy sounds from her throat, you know. And I was going to make an LP of her, and I was in India for three months, and I was going through everything. I also went through, what kind of cover should I, I design for her, you know, what, what, it, what the package should be like. And the natural thing about that I got from her and her books, her book, is it? Grapefruit and thing, was the uh, simplicity and childlike, you know, and innocence. And if you look at it with the hang-ups, it looks devious and complicated, you know. But if you just look, at, like two virgins can be devious and complicated, mm -hmm. but it can also just be John and Yoko in that room with a couple of tapes, meeting at certain points and not meeting, and so on, like any music, you know. And uh, I forgot what I was saying. Oh yeah. Mm. And then we just got up. I thought uh, <laughs> so. The best the best cover for her would for her to be naked and sort of say, "This is me," you know, no arty cover or you know, and no design to it. Just a plain, straight video. photo of her mm. naked mm. as her work is. You know. And, and then, then when we got together, excuse yeah, me. All right, go ahead. Uh, it was story. natural. <laughs> For us both to be naked, I just thought, I didn't think of any results or why or what's going to happen. <clears throat> it was just naturally when we got together and made the, the LP together, that we should both be naked on, on the cover. Yeah. You know, I didn't think anything to I started getting reaction from people, you know. You didn't feel that there, the consequences would, you know, you didn't feel that people would get very uptight about this? No, I couldn't see that, you know. I mean, I had some inkling when I first showed people, or even when I first got it back, I got the surprise of seeing myself actually naked, you know. But I thought, well, well why not, you know? We're all naked, uh, And so 
It was just when I started showing it to people and people reacted very strongly. They thought, maybe there's some trouble here, you know, and it built up from that. But I did it in all innocence. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was just going to say that the gardener is coming uh, when uh, John sent me a letter from India, you know, and uh, with a drawing of me naked on a sort of a huge glass wall, you know, sort of sitting on it. And he said, well, how about this as a uh, cover design, you know? John, the revolution... Um, I don't think necessarily it stems from the song that the Beatles did. I think it was a long time before that. Mm. How do you think it's going? I've no idea, really. No. As far as what you see and experience yourself. I don't know. I just know the, there's something in the air, you know. That's all I know. And I don't know what form it takes. I don't know whether you know, five million people in Trafalgar Square or two virgins cover is doing it or is or both of them doing it and to what extent they're having the effect. But I know look, a lot of people are trying for the same thing, you know, but I don't know how well or bad it's going. You know. I go from one extreme to the other thinking it's it's all fine and we are changing it to we don't stand the pig's chance, you know. Well, do you think you and Yoko and <clears throat> even the Beatles generally kind of stand for, you know, what is going, you know, to, to further this revolution? Yeah, I mean, we're for the revolution, whatever it is, you know, but as I sort of said in that song, I'm not pro-violence, you know. I don't particularly yeah. put down, I'm not saying, or oh, get off the streets and stop marching and waving and distracting people. But uh, I can't give a yes to, let's destroy it all, you know. I don't think that's the answer. I think it's the same uh, idea as a few years ago and it was drop out, you know. What, what we believed in was dropping in and change it, you know. It's the only way. Because uh, you might be dropped out in Cornwall or California or anywhere, but if you, the revolution doesn't happen, they're going to get you there, you know, and you've got to get in it and mix it a bit. The revolution hopefully is happening, and this is 1969 is pro probably going to be the most important year as far as whether it's going to really happen or just these stirrings are going to die out because people selling out. Now, the two, so two versions of revolution that you did, they changed. Mm. One word changed, really, but it was such an important one as far as people listening to the Beatles and John Lennon are concerned. Mm. Uh, if you talk about destruction, you can count me out and then in. Well, that means I'm not sure. You know. <clears throat> I have both versions of it are so different. The one on the LP is the original version, and the this the one that was on the single record of Hey Jude was the second version, or third or something. And I really think, you know, if it gets to destruction, you can count me out. But I'm not sure, you know, I'm human, and I'm liable to change, or depending on the situation, I prefer non-violence, you know. Now, how is, how is your joint work going to further well, the revolution? Well, uh, both of us are actually uh, very, uh, positively, uh, you know, uh, doing things to change the world and all that, you know, and uh, f um, for the better. But not, not in the, in the city, well, we don't go to Trafalgar Square and sit or, you know, march or anything. But uh, that's not the only way, you know, we don't believe that that's the only way. <coughs> and uh, our way may be, uh, quieter and sort of slower maybe, you know, it seems. So people might be thinking that we're just evading it, you know, we're avoiding uh, problems and hassles. And all. But it's not like that at all. Actually, John's songs, you know, uh, the vibration that he's sending to, to the world through his songs, you know. And uh, 
the things that we're doing together, or my films, anything, you know, they're all just sort of uh, gradually changing, changing the world, I think. Well, John, what about, as, uh, do, you, do you feel then that everything you're doing, and Yoko too, really, as far as art is concerned, whether it's with the Beatles or with Yoko, that it's, it's merely just a lever to further the revolution? Well, it's that as well, you know. In other words, uh, we don't believe uh, <coughs> artists for art's sake. In other words, you know, we believe that artists... Uh, um, the means to an end. Well, no, I mean, artists are, are part of the society and definitely has to take, you know, responsibility as, as uh, a member of the society and, you know, not just uh, making things <coughs> to... Um, uh, decorate the gallery or anything, you know. Mm -hmm. it, it's definitely a message, definitely a communication, definitely something to change the world for the good, you know. John, does it bother you at all that your songs are taken on so many different levels as far as interpretations are concerned? No, because they, they are on all those levels, you know. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, I feel a bit sick. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Right. You know, they work on on all levels. Uh, you can make it. John, since you've kind of undergone this, this particular renaissance, which I think is a pretty good word for it. Very nice. Uh, <coughs> and you realize, you know, that you know, that the amount of power that you are kind of can kind of exert in the music world. Yes. And just generally in the world period. Has it affected the way you know, your, your lyrics are coming together, what you're trying to say. No. Now that you know what you've got. No, not... Because you... This power thing that we're supposed to have is this sort of abstract thing. And uh, the only time we ever try to sort of... say, uh, this, we, we're aware of this power, we're trying to do something with it, was with Maharishi and the meditation thing. And uh, that was the only time we sort of consciously thought, ha-ha, this power exists. Let's try and do something with it. And uh, I think it did some good. Uh, I still believe in meditation and the, the principles that were put forward to us. So that's the only conscious effort, you know. Now, the songs, I mean, you're vaguely aware that if, if you sing something, it's, it's going to go round all over the world, but you can't be that... You can't get, get into that while you're writing a song. You, it's a job writing a song, you know. And you're doing it and you're involved in it. And then sometimes you don't realize what you've written till after you've recorded it. Or even a year later, you know, I hear old records of ours and see things on different levels suddenly. Or I'll sing a, a song to Paul and he'll see it on a, a level that I haven't seen at all, you know. And that'll be the, the subtlest level you could sit, see it on. And even though I've written it, and somewhere in my soul knows whatever makes you write it like that, is aware of what, what it said, you're not always aware at the time of doing it, you know, just what you are saying. You know. Yoko, how do you and John feel that you're going to be able to kind of clue the world in to what you two are doing as far as art is concerned? Because I think really two virgins um, it's, it's a very heavy thing. Mm. And it is going well, to need some explanation. Well, it's just happened, you know. I mean, he has a, um, pop song background, you know, and I have, uh, sort of, I don't know if I can call it a classic in this background, but sort of something near to that. And also, uh, being Japanese and all that, you know. So that, uh, and all that came out, you see, just sort of naturally. And uh, we didn't plan it, we just improvised it, you know. And uh, uh, it was the first thing, improvisation that we did together. And somehow, um, when you hear it, you see how um, sort of closely knitted, you know, both of us somehow responding to each other and all that just happened. It's a, a record of our minds meeting, really. Mm. We'd met sort of 
much socially and got along and attracted to each other and all that. But this was uh, our first exploration, abstract, mind-wise, and we we met, you know, and you can hear it on the record. You know, it starts off and we put the tape on and this happens and that happens. In certain moments where we just have the same thought or the same vibration, like, and it happens with the Beatles too when they record, or any people recording, or any actors acting, there's a moment where they hit it. Very seldom they all hit it at once, there's usually somebody down or somebody up, and that, there's that story on the album, you know. Don't you think that that could have been made, you know, and should have perhaps been made clearer to the people that are going to buy this record? No, because you don't have to take it like that, you know. It's just incidental that it's like, uh, it's just my version of the walrus, you know, or whatever the song is. You know, I'm just sort of saying, on that day, this is how it happened. But as it's called, it's unfinished music, you know, you put it on and not listen to it, you put it on and listen to it, you can get into it, you can get into the sound of the wind, or the sound of feet, or geese, or cats, or the fire, or the clock ticking, and if you dig digging sounds, you can get into anything, you know, and you can get into it on that level, just as pure sound, you know. So in other words, you can really use it as almost <coughs> pure theatre, depending upon where your yeah, head's at at that moment. Yeah, and the same with the records, with the Beatle records, you know. You, all the versions that people have of it, all their interpretations are, are true, you know, for them. Like, if you believe it, it's true. And if you don't believe it, it isn't true for you. It doesn't exist, you know. If I don't believe you, in you, you don't exist. But two versions is slightly different in the sense that uh, um, it did actually uh, title unfinished music, you know, which means that we were very conscious of that, meaning that, uh, well, you can add anything to it, you know, your own sounds if you want to, or just in your mind. But you do them actually, too, if you want yeah. to. Yeah. Right, yeah. yeah. That moment that you were talking about when two heads arrive at exactly the same place, and it doesn't happen very often mm. among people that aren't associated often, <coughs> but the Beatles are, are together really so much of the time compared to, say, other groups like the Rolling Stones, who, with the exception of recording and touring, they're pretty much split up. Can you think of any real well, examples we go through of that, that too, happens? We, you know, that's the reason probably why we did the Beatles album quicker after Pepper, because we know there's this period where we don't get together and that's what we're going through now, really, is that we've got to readjust to each other. It's not, you know, although we've been married ten years, it's still as new as it ever was, and the relationships are that sort of... And you can't just sort of bulldoze through because we've been together so long, you know. We've got to feel our way and try and communicate or reach a certain level together to put it across, you know, otherwise it doesn't work. Can you think of any moments over the past, say, three albums that you can remember that all the four heads really came together at a certain point? I can't offhand you. I know there are moments it, throughout all the albums where we've hit it. Oh, and there's moments where two of us have, or three, or one has, you know. But I can't just name it like that. It's a very rewarding thing, though. You really know it's worth it when that happens. Well, it was reward. That was rewarding on stage too, when you hit it, you know, when you sort of were out of it and you were just playing. So we're really during the last tours in America, especially. I guess there was really very little musical together. No? Yes, because the music wasn't being heard, and it was just sort of it wasn't doing anything. It was just uh, a sort of freak show. The Beatles were the show, and the music had nothing to do with it. And as we were musicians, we felt there was no enjoyment in it. You know, we wanted, if we're going to be Beatles, the only reason to be Beatles is to make music, you know, and not just to sort of be in a circus. Yeah, so you don't feel that maybe this time, if you went back, what with the emergence of the underground, places like the Fillmore East and Fillmore West and the Avalon, uh, where people would go, and if it could be controlled in the right way, they would go and they would listen. And yeah, but we've done it. that gig, you know. We, we did it in Liverpool, Hamburg, and everywhere. And we haven't got a strong enough compulsion to do that gig. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. But John, you've come so far since then. Yes. Really, have you thought that maybe it'd but, be nice to lay it all out in front of them again? Well, I mean, that's what partly the reason for doing this show, doing a live sort of album with an audience, was just to do a, a you know, do that, really. Yoko, the Beatles are a very tightly knit entity. Mm. I imagine it must have been very difficult at first when, you know, you were confronted with all four of them at the same time and, and really saw how how tight and together they were, especially in a studio. Did it make you feel, you know, kind of alien at all? I just uh, didn't feel that so much uh, in the beginning because, um, you know, I was just sort of... Uh, I didn't meet John as one of the Beatles, you know. But she I didn't even met, know who I was when we first you know, met. You know, I just met John as John, you know. Mm -hmm. And so I got involved, all involved in our relationship, you know. And uh, I'm, I'm still that way, you know. So uh, I'm all involved uh, and excited about what we're doing together. And, uh, and uh, I'm interested in John's work and my work, you know, or the work that we do together, you know. But not so much Beatles because, well, that's something else, you know. So um, whenever uh, I'm reminded of it, you know, it's a strange feeling, really. And, uh, uh, for instance, um, um, the conversation tends to be all about Beatles all the time, you know. Sure. And um, in, when I'm, I'm, I'm such an involved person, so that I, I don't really, really realize that usually. But suddenly, sometimes I realize, oh, you know, it's just old Beatle talk, you know. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, so you can kind of shut your mind off to it in a way. <clears throat> yeah. But I was used to a situation where I was talking about, uh, about my work, you know. Yeah. So it's, it's a very different scene, probably. But I still don't feel it so much yet, you know, because we're so involved in what we're doing, you know. What are you two doing together right now, artistically? Uh, well, there's so many things we're doing now, actually. But, uh, A couple of films we're making, and, uh, there's, a, there's just quite a few things, a couple of shows in the offing, a couple of sort of theatre pieces in the offing. A couple of, uh, we've put a few contributed to a thing called the British Box, which is coming out in the States soon. Mm. Different artists just put different things in the box, you know. And we're just doing a lot. Mm. You, find, you, you must find that now, now that you've stopped touring, and that well, it's you been two years tour together, since we yeah. stopped touring. Yeah. But all right, say since uh, Magical Mystery Tour, I'd say since your association with Yoko. We that, met about then, yeah. Yeah, that your life must be so damn full now that you... Mm. Does that ever really scare you? You look, my gosh, the oh, things yes. that you're into. Yes, You know, because with the Beatles, I'd say, oh, well, there'd be an LP and that, and oh, there's nothing to do for a bit. I always never enjoyed not having anything to do and went through hell. And But now there's something to do all the time. You know? I mean, they're all, I used to think I wasn't working. But I'd just be in the garden making eight mil films or something, or just having vague ideas and things, which I didn't consider work. But when I met Yoko, I realised that it, that was work. You know, that's another kind of work. And so, one way or the other, I work all the time now. I think I always did, but I felt as though I wasn't working before. You're having to work at not working type of thing. Yeah, but I can't stand not working. You know. 